In the last few decades, fueled by an ethos of accountability and the ubiquity of standardized testing, education reformers have sought to link major HR practices to student test scores. This was seen, for example, in the heavy push for the use of value-added test scores in former teacher evaluations. While these efforts rely on the rhetoric of business comparisons and are commonly known as corporate education reform, many have noted that even these reform efforts are not based on cutting edge human resource management practices, but rather rely on outdated factory or assembly line approaches. So the role of educators was to serve as an instrument to achieve improvement on student test scores. That is, they are treated as a means to an end. Unfortunately, this has led to the stripping of teacher autonomy, increased workload and pressure, more test-based accountability, which has led to declining interest in the teaching profession as the job was deemed less and less favorable. Some of the things that I hear constantly is there are so many things to do and to get done in any one day. It is a constant wave beating you down minute by minute because every day starts out with a to-do list and before you leave your to-do list is typically twice as long. Meanwhile, progressive human resource management and other sectors have increasingly focused on accountability for working conditions, especially in the age of social media where employees are increasingly vocal about their work lives. As workforce author Jacob Morgan puts it, putting thought and intention towards designing employee experiences where people want to, not just need to come to work. Grounded in this modern approach to talent management and the education working conditions research, I introduced to the field talent-centered education leadership, or TCEL, a new way to think about how to manage the education workforce with an increased emphasis on intentional design of the employee experience to promote employee engagement and support. Critical to TCEL is how talent is interpreted and defined. When we think of talent management, it is most commonly treated as an exclusionary approach that restricts development and support to the chosen few in the organization worthy of being identified as talent. In fact, how education employers have historically defined talent and relatedly how they have defined professionalism often perpetuated inequity for traditionally marginalized groups. For example, these groups are disproportionately affected when workers are criticized or even penalized for being unprofessional by their employers for not dressing in traditional gender conforming attire or wearing their hairstyles in braids or dreadlocks. From a talent centered education leadership perspective, it doesn't make any sense because these employees are unfairly facing unfavorable employment responses for factors that have nothing to do with their job performance. I identify as a, uh, a gay Jewish man. Um, so I kind of have a very unique, as does everybody else, a unique identity in terms of intersectionality. I'm very heavily tattooed. Currently in the school district's discrimination policy, sexual orientation is not listed in all of the characteristics that are protected against discrimination. They still hold a certain stigma, a certain negative connotation. I constantly wear long sleeves in a position where a lot of teachers wear short sleeves. It's hard for me to show school spirit because most of the school shirts come in short sleeves. Throughout the day, there are a lot of microaggressions, not just for, for me, uh, but for a lot of the other teachers that are in marginalized categories as well. It's also difficult because as I try to further my career and my education, intelligence will be, I feel like will be monitored as being diminished based off of what they see. I've had more challenges than just because of tattoos. I've had challenges based off of political ideas. I've had challenges based off of the, uh, my hearing uh, or loss of hearing, I should say. I'm wearing hearing aids as a child. And so I am not included. I do not feel included. At the heart of talent-centered education leadership is an emphasis on humanizing the education workspace and responding to employee needs. And that can't be done without acknowledgement and celebration of the increasing diversity of its workforce. Talent-centered education leadership leads with the word talent because equity and excellence are not mutually exclusive. What I've noticed in my almost 20 years or so in the system is that the further up I am removed from the classroom, I may not see as many females. Same for being a a woman of color in the, I may see some in the classroom, but I'm not a lot in the leadership spaces of the school. And as I move up into the district level and beyond, I'm seeing less and less of myself. But one barrier that I've seen to be 
uh, constant in my com communications with others who are also working in this space is really kind of deconstructing um, the uh, frameworks or the foundations of institutional practices that have kept um, underrepresented population or minority populations from being able to uh, ascend to positions to be able to make the necessary changes. There's often resistance to that because some may not feel uh, that those barriers actually exist and don't fully understand uh, the, the impact of these barriers and how it has uh, continued to marginalize um, students of color, continue to marginalize employees of color. As an African-American male, I look around our profession and only 2% of educators are black males. And therefore, uh, when you look at who's available to, to teach or to be a lead teacher or to be an administrator, uh, the pickings are slim. Another reason why it's important to diversify the workforce um, is because homogenous faculties lack the empathy and life experience of those who are different. So they're less likely to see uh, microaggressions or flat out uh, oppression or prejudice um, because it's something that's not in their experience. How powerful it would be if every child uh, met a teacher along the way who could connect with them, who could understand their lived experiences and uh, as a result uh, use that connection to help them grow. Now we have to ask ourselves are we really reaping the benefits of diversity or are we just checking a box to say, hey, we've counted a certain number of people? While the focus on education working conditions is often on teachers, from a talent-centered education leadership perspective, it is important that we also be intentional about our design of the employee experience and engagement activities for other education staff and employees, including bus drivers, nutrition specialists, and janitors who are often from marginalized groups and neglected in conversations about improving the education work environment. The most of the people of color at my school happen to belong to the janitorial staff, which reinforces systemic racism and white supremacy. If we can flip that where students can see that um, diverse people and people of color can also hold those positions and be equals of teaching and principals and, you know, uh, superintendents and super, uh, superintendents of curriculum and instruction and just at all levels of leadership throughout the district, then we kind of flip it to be more equitable and more inclusive of everyone and everything inside our community. Currently, there is a lot of innovation that's being taken place to address equity, social justice, um, and, and, and other race-related impact on the school system. One example of this is Richland School District 2's nationally recognized Premier 100 program. The Premier 100 project is a project that we implemented a couple years ago. This project is centered around our goal of recruiting, developing, and retaining 100 men of color uh, in our classrooms for our students. The data is very clear on the impact of having a man of color in the classroom, particularly an African-American male, um, for our African-American students and how it impacts their education uh, experience throughout, the, th throughout their K through 12 educational experience. And so this gives us an opportunity uh, to really hone in on that and address something that is something head on that has a critical impact for the experience of the vast majority of the students that are in our school district. We want to also demonstrate and be a model and show how this work uh, is, why this work is important and how other districts could replicate our work. So we're, uh, we're looking to provide some sort of framework that we can share with other school districts that they're interested in, in, in doing so. Um, and uh, it doesn't just stop with classroom teachers. There are so many more critical areas where we need men of color. Uh, we need more male counselors, men of color who are counselors. Another critical area is school psychologists. And I think that has an actual direct impact on the number of African-American male students um, who are being identified for special education services because there's sometimes a, dif a cultural disconnect in looking at behaviors and actions and activities of, of young boys of color. The emphasis on Diversity for, for me, and I'll say for our district, is not that we attract the, the talent, but that we develop the talent so that they'll, they'll stay with us and they feel like they have an opportunity to, to grow. Like its student-based counterpart, differentiated instruction, TCEL reflects a more equitable approach to talent management by recognizing 
and acknowledging the importance of diversity and not treating everyone as having the same needs and motivation. The approach goes beyond addressing issues of diversity of representation by maintaining a work environment that cultivates a sense of belonging for all employees. This is highly relevant in the modern day context as younger generation of workers are increasingly looking for more diverse and inclusive workspaces. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go.